to our episode today of Meet Your Neighbors. Uh, we have the distinct privilege to be with Robert Ayuri today. Um, I, I think we are all really fortunate uh, to have him as our neighbor in Brantford. What an asset to our community. Uh, I think so. Uh, so, Robert, <laughs> Thank you welcome. so much. Thank you welcome. very much. You're welcome. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, literally, uh, we came and met Robert a couple of weeks ago and talked with him. And honestly, my jaw was, I was in awe. I think we both were. I mean, I know a lot of incredible people in the community. We both do, David and I, but um, I don't know. I think Robert just sort of is way uh, up there. Wow. So going over all his enormous accomplishments in skills. his short skills and mm -hmm. his short and precious life so far, um, we David and I talk, where do we begin? Mm -hmm. Everything he's done and is about is so fascinating. But we decided, Robert, Thank to you. start with language. You make me cry. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I swear to language. So, yeah. we're going to ask you some questions, if you don't mind. No. What, how you answer me, I might understand if you speak English. But okay, no, you no, don't, no, no, yeah. I, no, but, I'll, I'll answer you in English. <laughs> how many languages do you speak? How many languages do you speak is... A hard one because you're always learning new ones and you know after a few glasses of wine you can speak 12 <laughs> you know after five glasses of wine you can speak 20 you know it's really sort of like that and so um, it's a hard question I mean I can tell you ones I'm good at okay you know um, or at least conversational you know um, Fine. Let's there's go. always a issue in linguistics between what's fluent right. what's bilingual okay. and, you know I'm not really bilingual in anything but I'm fluent, fluent. In a lot. yeah which means just you can carry on a conversation so in about how many language you, can you converse probably 12 ish 12 you know, yeah and then um, and it's always a, a strange um, question you know to okay. a answer because you know, you're at a party, someone asks you that question, and then the room goes silent and everybody's looking at you. you know? I know. And I've never really enjoyed that kind of okay. attention mm -hmm. um, because it's my thing. You know, things that I've done are about me, about things that I've enjoyed, mm -hmm. you know, rather than what people are going to think about, you know. Yeah, so, but it is quite admirable and it gives you, it opens up a world to you, doesn't it? Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, so, of those 12, can mm -hmm. you just name some of those? Yeah, um, so I'll. It sort of goes along with my story. So my family okay. is Italian. Great. And my grandparents came from three parts of Italy. So I heard bits and pieces of several dialects when I was a kid. Okay. And then as an adult, because I had the facility with Italian, I worked at a company that sent me to Italy. So then I started to learn sort of standard modern Italian mm -hmm. uh, and worked there for quite a number of years. But I also went to school in France. My aunt, when I was seven years old, told me that you have to go abroad. So I remember... Wow. And she passed away when I was 10. Oh. So I had always remembered, you know, whatever. But I really wanted to go. And so I went to France. <laughs> then I studied in Germany. Then I lived in Holland for a while. Then my job took me to uh, Spain, Portugal, Hungary, Greece, uh, Sweden, Norway, uh, then Asia. So, Robert, when you went to all these countries... Mm -hmm. You weren't just a typical tourist like David and I have traveled uh -huh. a lot, but you know, sure. three weeks yeah. we don't yeah, learn. No. <laughs> right? Uh, you live there. You live. Yeah. In so, these so what I so what I did was, you know, my job was great, but you know, I used it to travel. I mean, there's nothing better when you have an expense account and people are paying for your hotels. Mm -hmm. So I worked at a really good company, uh, which was called Dragon Systems, okay. uh, and there was speech recognition was the field. And so, uh, you know, they, for lack of a better term, you know, they really respected my ability and let me do what I wanted to do. So I had the opportunity, if I went to Beijing, you know, I'd leave on Friday, get there over the weekend, so I could, you know, be a tourist, Explore. then, you know, work all week, and then come home on the following Monday, so I would have another weekend, you know, so I would do that a lot when I traveled. But that didn't afford you the opportunity a long weekend to learn the language. No, no, no. The, so the language, the language is my avocation, my hobby. You know, I mean, my sister was learning uh, French in high school. I took her book and started to learn it too. 
<laughs> you know, it just was a facility. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, I worked at MIT for four years uh, in the foreign language department. Oh, and I didn't really do any particular research on, but I was surrounded by a lot of people who were. So, uh, so what I think I've come across, uh, discovered, and really be here in Brantford, because it is so quiet, you know, and after living in New York City for so long, you know, Brantford was really quiet, you know, quiet. and when you live in a quiet place, you tend to think more. And what I found was that for some reason, hearing a language or hearing an accent does something in my brain. It, it causes some kind of pleasure of feeling. So for me, it wasn't just an ability to learn language. It was also a pleasurable feeling to... Like, I love to listen to a language I don't understand. Wow. You know, I, I, I think it's, there's something that goes on in my brain. And I've talked to a lot of people who do research, and, and they say that we're finding out that that's, that's a case. So similarly, someone who's good at math, somehow their brain enjoys that journey of <clears> going <throat> through, and I don't know why, but, <laughs> but you know. It really go, doesn't matter. Yeah, math, you know, I was really bad at math. <laughs> but my point is, you know, there's whatever our gifts are tend to be something that our brain really likes. Mm -hmm. It's and almost like music, isn't it? It's, it's like music, mm -hmm. yeah. It's like anything that someone's good at that they don't really know why. Because mm -hmm. uh, I know many mathematicians who are brilliant and mm -hmm. they just spend hours and hours and hours going through proofs of things, which would drive me crazy. Right. And there right. also must be an inquisitiveness where you want to try to understand. I wonder what you And you, you know. Yeah, challenge. and that happened to me. Yeah. That happened to me when... My grandparents would speak Italian or I'd be like, what are they saying? Or my my aunt's husband's family were Polish, you know, and Polish was really a mystery to me, you know, because it sounded so Different. foreign, you know, from Italian. yeah, from Italian. So, yeah, that all j really jazzed me. And I was always thinking and looking and, you know, if the Internet had been around when I was a kid, I would speak 50 languages, yeah. you know, but we didn't have languages. We ha I had the World Book Encyclopedias, which are actually right there off camera. Wow. OK, well, so we, we don't know if you got to Greece yet, but as far as mm -hmm. I'm concerned with languages, uh -huh. it's all Greek. <laughs> yeah, it is, exactly. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, if you don't mind, I just would like no, no. to proceed a little bit more yeah, yeah, of because I find it fascinating. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, are you willing to name for us the twelve languages? Oh, sure. That so, you're yeah. In? So English. Right? You always, <laughs> okay. Right? That's one of them. I Good. Get to, I get to count English. Good. Uh, then you know French, Spanish, Italian. Portuguese, Italian. So the main Romance languages. I don't speak Romanian, which is a Romance language. Uh, then German, mm -hmm. Dutch, uh, Swedish, and consequently Norwegian and Danish are com are the same basically. Spelling different, but basically the same language. Little different pronunciation, but you know I can carry on the conversation. Um, mm. Let's see. Then uh, you know I moved to Asia at some point. I studied for a short period of time at Yale. I studied Chinese, so Mandarin, and then <laughs> Cantonese kind of comes a little naturally if you do speak Mandarin. Anyway, uh, and then Japanese, Korean, yeah. It's I, yeah, I, it makes me silent. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I know. It just you know, think of whatever you love to do and yes, do it really well, and well, that's sort of what it is. And uh, I, I always hate the question because you know I never did it to impress anybody. No, you know, I did it because it really was no, my it's a joy. thing. It's a joy for me. It's a passion. Exactly. And I think you know, passions for everyone are different. And if yes. we if we honor our passion and proceed in that path, I think often we yeah. do really well yeah. because we love it. Exactly. Um, I so, think Oprah Winfrey said that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, so I'm also curious. I'm really talking a lot about language. No, it's fine. It's, just, it's, it's just, my I love languages, okay, so please so feel free. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so. This might sound a little like a foolish question, but to no, me it would be interesting. No, no foolish um, questions. Each language is so uniquely different yes. and admirable in its own way mm -hmm. and difficult and challenging in its own way. Yes. But um, uh, do you have favorites? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah, so yeah, what of might course, they of course. be? So, yeah, so my favorite language is Dutch. Dutch? <laughs> because it's kind of a cute language, you know, like... <laughs> The first time I was in Amsterdam, I, you know, was in a telephone booth, you know, 
well, it's a telephone booth, right? We don't have them anymore, but no. yeah. But telephone in Dutch is spelled T E L E F O O N. So to me, it looked telephone. like telephone, right? <laughs> right? So I thought, well, that's kind of fun. And then because there's a lot of double vowels in, in Dutch and there's lots of diminutives. So, like, you know, like in Spanish, you know, Carlito, the, those diminutives, those little things. Or in, in Yiddish, you know, like, la, they say, you know, um, spetzla. You know, for you know the little <laughs> uh at the end, I mean, is it a diminutive? So Dutch has lots of diminutives. So it it just sounds really cute when people speak it. Can we hear it? Can you say something for um, us? Yeah. What can I say? I'm so glad that you are here today. And I hope that we can have a good conversation. So, <laughs> you're so glad we came. Yes. See, yeah. it sounds a little like, Ooh, like yes, Yiddish. like Yiddish. Yeah. Well, you know, it's in a Germanic home, languages. Well, welcome to my home. Yeah, did you say yeah, that? yeah. I heard home. Another really weird thing about languages. Um, so if you're inclined to think that you've had former lives, yes. sometimes I wonder if I did. Who you were, where you were. Well, one time, I, I, so when I was in New Haven 30 years ago, I worked in a restaurant. And, you know, I hated Sunday mornings and I couldn't, I was tired on Sunday mornings still to this day. So I worked at a restaurant in New Haven and I always had to work brunch and I was 24 or something. And one day this woman came in and she actually came to the restaurant early. Uh, we started at 1130 and she was allowed to be seated at 11 o'clock in the morning. So I was really angry. Like, <laughs> uh, but she was quite elderly. She was probably in her early 80s, maybe, or oh. even a little older. And I went up to the table and she grabs my wrist and she says to her husband, oh, this kid has so much energy. Really? And I was like asleep. <laughs> so long story short, she said to me that I was a Dutch minister in the 15th century oh and gosh. that I was not Marco Polo, but that I was <clears throat> with Marco Polo. And, you know, I thought, well, maybe I am something. And, you know, when I started to learn Dutch, my Dutch teacher was like, God, you really learning this fast, you know. And I just thought it was because I liked it, you know. And then Chinese came very easy, too. Wow. Chinese, you wouldn't think, right? But it no. came so easy to the point where... In my first couple lessons of Chinese, my Chinese teacher asked me, did I study Chinese before? And I said, no. So oh, that's amazing. there might be something like that. So can you say, is that another favorite? Chinese? Is oh, it? yeah, definitely. I'm please? great at restaurants. Ah, <laughs> love it. I would love to go with you. I've had some, time. yeah. So I've had, and I actually worked in a restaurant for uh, six months in a Chinese restaurant. And did you speak Chinese? I learned more and more and more. Yeah, of course, you know, along with the foods. cooking. Yeah, along with cooking and learning all the traditional dishes, etc., I also definitely, you know, learn more speaking. So, wow. um, so yeah, can so you Chinese say is something? yeah, so Chinese is a, a tonal language. So when you speak Chinese, uh, you have to have a tone to your words. So, so you so for instance, when you study Chinese, you repeat things like ma 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 or ta 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 ta. And each reflection means is a different word. Different. Yes. So a good example of that would be the combination of shui and jiao. So you, if you shui jiao, then you sleep. But if you shui jiao, <gasps> is a dumpling. Oh. So yeah. So we are chi shui jiao means I want to have dumplings. Uh, but we are shui jiao means I want to sleep. Oh, quite different. <laughs> so it, yeah. So it doesn't seem different to us. But I always was really amazed in China. If you do use the wrong tone, they don't understand what you of mean. Of course. Or to us, it sounds so similar, right. but it's not similar at all. Wow. To them, wow, what a heightened ability to hear and yeah, listen. Yeah, exactly. Um, so would you kindly say something to us in Chinese? Yeah. Um, uh, have no clue. Can't figure yeah. that one out. So yeah, I say just welcome to my house and nice to meet you. Thank you. Yeah. Wow, beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna ask one more sure, a third, of course. Yes, a third of course. language that yeah. you just simply love to talk in. Um, I think French. French. Yeah, it's so French. Beautiful. French is the only language that I really learned, you know, in school, you know, at university, and I had to really study, you know, very hard and very. Yeah, so I really worked hard to be at a university level of French. And so 
I just think it's beautiful. It is beautiful. Yeah, Can it's you beautiful. please say something? Um, sure. Uh, <laughs> um, je suis très content que vous êtes, uh, vous êtes venu aujourd'hui chez moi et j'espère qu'on va avoir une bonne conversation. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I got conversation out of it. Yeah, yeah. conversation. I actually just made a mistake, but anyway. That's all oh. right. Nobody, most of Nobody us won't right, know yeah, the yeah. difference. And you yeah. said... I said, it was so nice that you came to my house, and I hope we have a nice conversation. Yes. <laughs> so, Magnificent. Yeah. You know, we're sitting here. Oh, look, folks. I mean, this is one thick book. Yeah. yeah. Are wow. you studying this book? So this book, so along with Chinese speaking, <laughs> I really like writing Chinese. And so, uh, so you know, Chinese calligraphy is a bit, is a, you've seen it. You know, whatever, and so this is actually a dictionary of of Chinese calligraphy styles because there's many many different styles. And the title the title actually says calligraphy dictionary. Oh, okay. So you can when you open it up, you can see <clears throat> different ways of writing the same character. And so it's really I love the book. I mean, I have it bookmarked, and I I practice. It's called shufa. In Chinese, sufa means calligraphy. And so uh, I practice almost daily. Wow. Do yeah. You? And again, I don't know why. You love it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And it's, you know, never going to make me any money or anything. But, you know, I just feel a comfortability with it and a peaceful tranquility. And wow. here in Brantford, <laughs> I'm very tranquil. <laughs> yeah. No. So it's all good. It's, yeah. It's all good. It really right. is quite nice. And, uh, I have a lot of Chinese friends who are also very interested in calligraphy because calligraphy in the Western world, like the English world, is kind of an old craft uh, that has meaning and is beautiful. But in Chinese, because the Chinese characters are pictograms of words, you can actually make some really interesting uh, puns, really interesting, you sort of add a sense of beauty to a writing that you would never have in a Western language. We just don't have the same depth to add a picture with our words. Yeah, it's not quite art, our language. Yeah, yes. exactly. Mm -hmm. Chinese Chinese can be, uh, I mean, I could talk about this forever, but I'm sorry. But no, the thing is, you know, it's fascinating. yeah, you, you can really, when, when someone writes a poem, um, you not only have the words, but with the characters, you can draw lots of visuals. You can draw lots of puns. You can draw a lot of uh, visuals that will add to the, to the depth of a poem. And the beauty. Uh, and the, the beauty, beauty of a poem. Uh, yeah, I exactly. I think also Mixed. Persian, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Persian yeah, the is Persian gorgeous. and Arabic. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, you know, that's a whole other different thing. Um, but I actually have a friend who <laughs> he's in Iraq actually, uh, and I met him online. And uh, he is an artist, oh. and it's so funny you mention that because what he does is he takes an Arabic. He, he's a he's a schooled Arabic calligrapher, and just like you know Hebrew, you've seen mm -hmm. beautiful Hebrew beautiful. hand done. Yeah, it's so beautiful, and so he does the very wispy Arabic it's writing. Gorgeous. But what he does is so amazing. He then takes that that Arabic character. He turns it on its side to make it look Asian. So he's he's really it, it's just the first time I saw his stuff it just really blew me away because you know in our such divided world mm -hmm. and such fearful world of other cultures etc here is this artist who is building bridge. a bridge exactly. between some things that are so disparate you would never think that a Japanese character is going to look like an Arabic right. script and vice versa and to add even more interesting thing he writes them, then I get to look at them. Wow. And you would be shocked at how many times his Arabic turned Japanese actually looks like the Japanese character. It's uncanny. It's, un it's uncanny. And it's, to but me, doesn't it's, it show the oneness of us all? <laughs> oh, totally, totally. And I just, I love to, and I'm trying actually to figure out a way to get him out of Baghdad, wow. you know, which is not a very good situation right wow. now. But try to bring him, you know, to some to the states and to have him be shown because it is exactly this notion of bringing together 
two disparate parts of the world that you would never even oh, begin I just to love think. That. Yeah, it's really cool. That's what peace is built on. Mm, absolutely. Um, so there's one more piece to this, sure. folks, because this is, un I mean, really, Robert oh, is just okay. a wealth. Anyway, thank um, you. You did calligraphy in Chinese yes. and Japanese, and yes. you told David and I when we came last time mm -hmm. to talk with you that one, I think it was a Chinese elder that said, yes. that you could not have done this. I don't believe yeah. you did it. Yep. Um, yeah. so it was actually... So what happened was I drew, as I do on a daily basis, I work on calligraphy. And so I did, um, well, it's funny, I'll tell you a secret. That, <laughs> so Chinese famous calligraphers often in history do their best calligraphy when they're a little tipsy. <laughs> oh, gosh. And it's a, <laughs> it's a kind of thing. So one night in Boston, actually, I did this calligraphy and I was pretty tipsy. <sighs> and um, it just came out really well. And it's, they talk about the chi and how the chi will energy. flow better. Yeah. And when you're a little tipsy, you don't put up a lot of walls and your chi can flow better. And when you write, your brush goes really smoothly and boom, right? And wow. there's plenty of history examples of this in China, Taiwan, Hong Kong. So anyway, so I did this and I rolled it up and I forgot about it. So then I moved to New York and I had all my things brought down there. And then I unfurled it one day and I thought, well, I should really frame this. So I went down to Chinatown to a framing shop. Uh, it was an art slash calligraphy slash framing shop. And I brought it in and I asked the man, you know, how much would it cost to frame this? And he said to me, who did this? <laughs> and I said, I did it. And he said, no, you I didn't. I don't think so. I said, I did. He said, no, you didn't. So then he went to the back of the room. He brought out a Chinese stone with ink on it and a brush. And he gave me a piece of paper he and he said, you. show me. <gasps> yeah. But and you I, weren't tipsy, though. I wasn't tipsy, but I proved my I proved that I oh. could really write Chinese characters with a brush. And then after that, his son, his daughter, his grandparents, and his <laughs> wife all came out to see the white guy who could write <laughs> Chinese characters. That's, That's what I was told. Incredible story. Yeah, it's so funny. Uh, yeah, and then it's in my bedroom, the piece. And yeah. Can yeah. we can we take a second for you? Can you get it off the wall? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, okay, of course, we of course. can take a second. Yeah. Thank you. So, Robert, thanks so much for bringing that in. Yeah. Can you just sure. explain what? Um... Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's a, a Taoist Taoist expression. And it means um, basically don't, not, do or be. So Taoism was all about just kind of letting things happen. Because, you know, the Tao is already predestined pre, um, for you. And so in China, it was very important. I mean, a country with billions and billions and billions of people. And uh, they learned that, you know, don't sweat. I guess don't sweat the small stuff oh, is basically what is it means. Oh, is that what it means? Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's such and an important... it's going to happen. Right. Because it's, happen. Whatever, whatever is predestined to you in your Tao right. will happen. So the cool thing about this also was uh, the way I found, where I found this expression was in the Forbidden City in, in Beijing. Wow. Um, it was right above the throne of the wow. emperor. Really? Yeah. And, you know, obviously you can imagine <laughs> what the message was. You know, with the emperor of China, with people coming into him and, you know, saying, oh, my, it's flooded and there was a typhoon. And, wow. and he would say, don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> He's a wise man. And I didn't know, I knew the characters up on that throne, but I didn't know what it meant. So mm -hmm. I, you know, remembered it and then I found out what it meant. Beautiful, oh, beautiful. Wow. Yeah. So I... Um, yeah, I think it goes along with, you know, we plan, we plan, and life happens. Yeah, doesn't that's it? exactly what this means. So that's why I have it in my bedroom. Because <laughs> in the morning, I remember this expression, and more importantly, at night when you can't sleep. Good. Beautiful <laughs> yeah. to remember. So, yeah. I, yeah, I just wanted to say yeah. one more thing. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're learning one more language. Yes. Which is it? You oh. said you were studying another language Asian. now. Yes. Yeah, so, oh, sorry. So, yeah, so, well, remember I said, you know, I always study languages. So I'm actually, at the moment, kind of uh, really doing more in-depth Danish, um, also Korean. Yeah. And also, in the last two months, three months, I've come back to Arabic um, mm -hmm. because 
Uh, Arabic is, it's not very easy. It's a pretty complicated language if you're a Western language speaker, but you know, challenge, right? <laughs> right. And, and it's, so, it's actually really close to Hebrew. You know, they're the same root, you know, Semitic yes. languages. And I often, We're cousins, if Yeah, only. I know, I know, right, I know. And you see, but you see, you hear a lot of similar words in, mm. um, in Arabic and uh, Hebrew, so, which I've studied, you know, I've studied Hebrew. I don't speak it, oh, but I've studied it really enough to know. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, because remember I told you I wanted a bar mitzvah? And <laughs> I couldn't have a bar mitzvah because I was Catholic. But I remember thinking, oh, you get to speak That's a foreign so... language in front of a group of people. I thought, I want to do that. <laughs> yeah, so anyway. I love it. Yeah, well, thank I you, swear thank that you. really happened. Robin Salowitz <laughs> and Cindy Steinberg were my friends, and they were getting their bar mitzvah. And I was like, what's that? Oh, Oh, we have to learn Hebrew. We have to say it in front of the congregation. I'm right. Like, a lot of really? us don't learn. How cool. It. <laughs> oh, anyway, yeah. Fascinating. So, Robert, you yes. told Marge and I that you yes. lived in New York City for 16 years. Yep. And uh, so what were you doing in terms of work? Yeah. So I originally got, so my background, my, uh, my uh, job is, has been, since around 1993, 94 in speech recognition. Oh. So Siri, you know, so yes, it was Siri. a real, yeah. Oh so it was goodness. a real easy transition from learning a lot of languages to then learning how to use languages uh, to write with your voice in a phone or on a computer. Okay. So I was so lucky, really lucky to find this job. Actually a friend of mine, dear friend of mine gave me the job uh, uh, advertisement when it was in the newspaper, remember that? No jobs. <laughs> There's yeah, no yeah, jobs yeah, advertisements yeah. Right, in newspapers right, online. Right. But I remember he handed me this thing and he said, this is your job. So oh. I never thought they'd hire me because it was really technical. But as I said, I had worked at MIT for four years and I took a lot of technical courses and stuff. But what they really wanted was my languages, which I've never thought was a big deal, you know, because <gasps> nice. it's what I've always known, you know. So they hired me and I really just enjoyed that job incredibly. I mean, it was... I was allowed to learn more languages. You know, I did press conferences in French and whatever. Um, I gave a speech, small speech, in front of a group of a thousand Chinese developers once oh, in Chinese, gosh. and nobody listened to me. They just were thinking, "Oh my God, this white he's, guy is yeah, speaking he's Chinese." White. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah. So in New York, I continued with that and continued to. When I hit 42, I thought, "Well, now I can be a consultant." You know, you get paid a little more and your taxes are a little bit easier. <laughs> so that's what I did. Wow. So what brought you then to Brant? Oh, that's not so happy. So oh. um, my sister about seven years ago had a very bad stroke. Oh. And uh, I, she was in Gaylord, which I think you guys might know here yes. in mm -hmm. Connecticut. She passed away or she was um, in Gaylord for about two and a half years. And then she went into a nursing home for about a year. And then her doctor said she could live alone. And at this point, the writing was on the wall. You know, I needed to come up and kind of oh. help her. And then my mom uh, uh, simultaneously was getting older and she ended up falling, breaking her hip and moving into the same nursing home. Oh. Oh. So I luckily had two people in the same nursing home. I didn't have to go to two different ones. Mm. But that's the reason why I moved up oh. here. Yeah, and I chose this house because it was affordable, you know, way more, way cheaper than New York. <laughs> and, and how long have you been living here? Uh, it's going to be four years, four actually, years. yeah. Oh, and wow. so it's flown by. So then there's quite a difference between the big city yeah. and Brantford. <laughs> yeah. I know, so. Yeah. So oh, it was I... really hard. I mean, I think for the first year, though, I was so focused on helping my sister and my mom uh, that I didn't really pay much attention. I definitely felt lonelier I felt quiet you know it was yeah, way quieter right. although I chose the bedroom in the house that's the loudest because you need I, the noise. yeah and I live right on route one so I, <laughs> I never think there's noise people who live here say oh it's so noisy on route one I'm like I don't Not hear it you. I still don't hear it you know <laughs> and in fact it makes me calm when I hear the cars um and also my friends you know I missed my friends oh, I mean yeah. luckily I'm still in touch with a lot of them and I've made friends in Brantford you know good yeah I have really good friends um Strega restaurant is one of my places I get, hang out. We speak Italian and oh, great place. And um, yeah, I always yeah. find the people who speak foreign languages somehow. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess you're going to tell me now yeah. uh, that you probably work from home. 
yes. for, for a living, yes. aside from all the arts and crafts yes, and exactly. skills that you have. Yeah, um, so I was, I, you know, obviously worked uh, in offices for a long time, but, you know, the, the economies are such that you can work at home. And when I lived in New York, it was easy to work at home uh, because then I could go out and have lunch at a restaurant or something. When I moved to Brantford, I was worried that, you know, working at home was going to be challenging. But it actually isn't, you know, um, and I built around me all these things that I do to kind of keep myself occupied. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. So do you still get to travel with your work? Or? Yeah, I mean, I don't travel internationally at all. It's always <clears throat> in the United States now, which is important. So you go from here to New York. <laughs> I go here to New York, yeah. Sometimes California, Las Vegas, uh -huh. of course, because Las Vegas always has large technical trade oh, yeah, shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I go to those. Um, but I have to kind of stay close to be near my mom and make sure she's good. And, yeah. So um, your mom is still alive? She's still alive. She's 92 this November 3rd. Oh, my sister yeah. passed away oh, a year did. and a half ago. And my mom and she were close friends. So I can't really abandon my mom. You know, I have to stay with my mom. Oh, <laughs> you know, I always say she made sure my diapers were clean for the first five years of my life so it's time for me to that's know, beautiful a, we don't well you have to that yeah much, i can so. yeah i have to yeah I people say that and i think how can you not mm -hmm. but yeah. some of us don't yeah. so anyway. i still admire Thank it you. when Thank someone you. does yeah. um so robert we know you lived in france you mentioned uh -huh. that yep. and we also know that you're um you're quite a great cook um, did yeah. you learn some of this when you oh, lived in Oh, for sure, Korea? yeah. So, so I, I was so lucky to have two grandmothers, a grandfather and a father who loved to cook as well. My mom as well. But, you know, the foods that were are so popular now in restaurants, I was eating when I was a kid. You know, polenta and uh, arugula salad and mozzarella. But you mozzarella. didn't like it as a kid, did you? Well, I didn't like <laughs> No, I didn't actually. <laughs> Some of it was a little sour or whatever, but <laughs> Italians like sour flavors. Um, anyway, but, you know, so I was, that was really good. And then when I was in France, I actually had a really close friend who was a chef. And I used to come in, I lived about 45 minutes from Paris. Her restaurant was in Paris. And I used to come in on the weekends and help her in the kitchen mm -hmm. and didn't realize I was learning basically classical French technique. Wow. You know, how to make, you know, apricot glazes and, mm. you know, croissants and all that stuff. And so it was really, really cool. And then... You know, uh, with the food and with the language, I was always the one at the table, you know, how do you pronounce this? How do you say this? And so that's where my language stuff, right. the food website came about. It's yeah. so beautifully paired. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> and again, back to the notion of me doing things that I like, you know, I like to do it. And so I blog every day and write something, you know, on the, on the blog every day just because I think it's so fascinating. There's things we don't realize about food along with foreign language that are so obvious, but we don't know them. And when, once we learn them, we think, wow, that's so cool. Yeah, it is. So that's... Um, I know you call yourself, I believe, a language chef. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? So we came up with the name The Language Chef because it was about language and food. So, you know, um, to say basically that, you know, we're cooking, you know, so there's a chef, but there's also... The language part of it. So that's the blog. That's the blog. That's the blog. Is the language chef, yeah. So do you have a lot of folks following Yeah, you? yeah. Wow. I mean, I don't do a lot of aggressive marketing and stuff like that. We have in the past. Uh, we There was once where there was going to be a television show. Uh, that fell through because of YouTube, right? YouTube okay. all of a sudden became really popular. Um, and I had to make a living, you know, so I had to really work and whatever. But um, uh, But it's still there, and I do it because I like it. Good. You know, and someday someone maybe will... We'll do something with it. Um, and are you cooking in all different, all ethnic cuisines? Yeah, I mean, so when you move from New York City to Brantford, <laughs> if you want takeout, you can get it. But if you want good takeout, you have to make it. <laughs> so I end up making a lot of food. I do everything from Italian to Chinese to Middle Eastern to Indian, you know, and I do it myself. You know, I like to do it. It's relaxing and, you know, I have time. I, I when I came here, I had a lot of time. You know, I didn't run out and go to bars. <laughs> I, you know, stay at home and cook. And so, but I always liked to cook. I always liked to cook. It always was something that relaxed me. It was always something that was part of my family. We always were in the kitchen. We were always eating. We were always at the dining room table. And connecting and gathering. And gathering and being a time. It's a beautiful part. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, 
So we notice in the other room mm -hmm. um, that uh, there's the the open hearth. Yeah, the, you, in this historic house. And this historic yes, house. and this house yeah. is built when? 1710. 1710. Yep, it is exactly. very charming and mm -hmm. immense character. Does every room have a fireplace? So there's four fireplaces, and um, not every room has a fireplace, but in the old days, the fires were always going in the fireplace, which ended up warming the chimney. And the chimney then would radiate heat out. So you would, the fireplace we're sitting in front of is actually blocked off. Oh. But the other three fireplaces I can, I can and use. And are you heating that area of the home with the fireplace? So when it gets really, really cold, um, another thing I never noticed in New York City, right? Because you don't notice right. the weather really. You know, but when you're in Bradford <laughs> and it's 25 degrees out, you really you notice feel it. feel it. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. So I definitely, in the winter, have the fires going. Great. Yeah. So you're so, talking about sorry, the open yeah. hearth. Yes. So the open hearth in there, do mm -hmm. you cook? Oh, yeah, for sure. So just another story about Italy. So when I was 19 in France in school, I went to Italy for Easter vacation for two weeks. And I went to see my relatives. And... The first house I went to was my grandfather on my father's side, the relatives. And I walk into the house, and the kitchen is bare. There's nothing in the kitchen. It looked like they were moving. <laughs> like, there was, it was literally bare. So then I went through a door and walked into the living room slash dining room. And that's where my zia, means like aunt, who was really not my aunt. She was my grandfather's cousin's daughter's wife. <laughs> um, she was cooking on the fireplace. And she said to me, I said, you know, wow, that's so interesting. And... She was embarrassed and she said, oh, this is so old fashioned. But she oh. said, I learned how to do it this way. Wow. So she didn't learn how to use a stove. She, and this is in my lifetime, our lifetime. Oh. So I think of her all the time and I cook on this. And what, what people should really imagine and really appreciate, and especially in a place like Branford with lots of historical homes, those people, especially the women, worked really hard. I mean, to cook on a fireplace to bend over and to cook on a fireplace is excruciating. I mean, and I, I really may sound a little strange, but I really admire the people who lived in this house, mm -hmm. especially the women who had to work that mm -hmm. thing because it is not easy. But I work on it. You know, uh, there are a lot of Italian dishes that lend themselves to a pot. So, you know, tomato sauce, polenta, chicken stew, you know, a lot of Italian dishes that I grew up on. Uh, I can cook on the fireplace and it's a totally different taste. It is a different taste. Yeah, it's so different and I have had many friends come here and do it in the winter, you know, the fire's on and I cook on the fireplace and everybody loves it and they're all like, wow, it's so different. You know, Is it more enhanced, the flavors? So, yeah, so I think just uh, to make it sound easier, so when I do make tomato sauce, it can have a little smoky flavor so it can feel a little more barbecue sauce. Than mm -hmm. Italian sauce, but it's not really barbecue sauce, but it's has a flavor that you notice. Yeah, and I would think you know years ago, 1700s, 1800s, mm -hmm. families were larger. Oh yeah. So when they were cooking, they were cooking for hours and hours. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, yeah you didn't have um, big Y or no. stop and shop, so you had to Incredible. make all your food. And uh, when you really, when you do live in a house like this, and you see. A little bit of a glimpse of what it is. I mean, these people were hard, hard working people. Um, yeah. Is it all right with you if we take a look at the Oh, home? of course, yeah. So let's go, folks. Yeah. We'll show you the open hearth. Yes. So, folks, we're now in Robert's dining room, which is amazingly <laughs> charming, historic, um, <laughs> all the character you could want in a home. Mm. And this is the open hearth. So right. can you just give us a little bit of a sense sure, of Sure, right yeah. So, so we, um, this is the dining room now, but this really was the kitchen. Oh. Um, and you can't see it off camera, but there's a very big beam on to, the, to the left of me that was actually the end of the house, the original house. So oh. it was a very small room that could be heated by the fire. And so what I, what I have here are just... Um, two pots that I actually use. One of them actually is from Italy. Oh. It's a copper pot for polenta. Oh. So yeah, we, I use that. And then the smaller one I use to make some sauces or whatever, but um, you know, the, the, the crane moves out back and forth. Um, and there's a real way to know how to cook where you don't want to burn yourself and you don't yeah. want to. And sometimes it's often difficult to see in the pot because the fire's behind it and it creates a, a, it creates a, a shadow. Oh. 
Oh. Where you can't really see in the pot. So uh, whenever you cook on the fireplace like this, I'm always moving the moving the uh, crane out so I can see what's in the pot and then moving it back in. So you have to stir more often than usual. In the well, stove. so that's the other thing you learn to manage your coals. <laughs> Uh, so, um, and what's really interesting about this fireplace, as opposed to the other fireplaces, the other fireplaces were used to uh, to uh, push heat out into the room. Mm -hmm. so, <coughs> this this fireplace was actually made to cook things. So, when I the first time I started a fire in this fireplace, it took me a half an hour because uh, the fireplace this fireplace was built to have a slow burn okay. because it was a cooking fireplace oh. rather than a fast burn. Uh, in the other fireplaces that were meant for heat, and right. those are like those are really subtle little details about the house that you wouldn't really know unless you lived here and you right. you know try to start a fire in this fireplace because uh, again this fireplace was made for cooking with a slower flame and the other fireplaces were made to heat the room. So then, is it more comfortable to cook here in summer? Oh, that's right. a really good question. So yeah, so exactly. So. Um, out from the fireplace in the room here underneath the floor is a massive stone slab oh. and what it does is in the winter or in the summer it keeps the room cool oh. and the reason why they did that was first to balance the chimney so it didn't fall over but the effect that's also good. was yeah that's good <laughs> but the effect was also that it would keep this room cooler because they needed a fireplace during the summer so I have friends who come over in August hottest day of August you know, 95, 100 degrees, they walk in this room and they're like, oh, you have the air conditioning on? Oh, and I say, no, I don't. So again, another one of those little tidbits in the house that you don't realize about the house, but it's so interesting that they thought of those things back yeah. in the day. Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. Do you cook on a regular stove? Or yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah, of course. So do you only cook for company here? Or? No, no, I just cook for myself sometimes, no, just, you know, in the winter. I like to, I, yeah, I like to do the fire and cook sometimes myself. I have a lot of, um, uh, what do you call, um, cast iron pans that I use as well. And is that's, this, this is a Dutch oven, which oh. is actually used as an oven where you put something inside and then you put coals on it and it actually creates a small oven. So I oh. bake pies and stuff like that in there. In there? Yeah, in there, yeah. In that black? Yes, exactly. Yep. The, the, the cover comes off. There's stones at the bottom and you put in your plate, your pie plate, and then it creates a small oven where the, the heat is circulating. And then you put coals on the bottom and you put coals on the top. So did you learn all this, Robert? Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts. <laughs> yeah, I learned the Dutch oven in Boy Scouts okay. uh, because we used to go out in the you know, field and cook and it was really where I learned that. Fantastic. Fantastic. Boy Scouts. <laughs> I swear. Anyway, so I'm still here, and I, yeah. like, I have some other uh, points of interest that I'd of make, course, sure. would like to make, and yeah. actually I'd like to ask about some of your other skills, Okay. because I notice over on the other side of the room here... If we here, could take the viewers to the yes, other sure. part we have of the a dining large room. Lo yes. <sighs> yes. And a smaller one yes. in the back there, which yes. seems to be an active one. You have so the project going on? Here? Right, so they're both active. Um, oh. The one behind you, I'm actually threading up now. Ah. <clears throat> excuse me, threading up now to um, start to make a series of rugs. So what you see is, oh. the it's called the warp. So the warp yeah. is on the back, one on the back, and I'm, I'm threading through the heddles into the beater on the front, tie it on the front, and then start making rugs. Wow. You know, I volunteered at the, there's the Weaving Guild in Hartford. Yeah, we're very helping famous, yeah. People um, mm -hmm. it's quite complicated. <laughs> well, yeah, so, well, it's not so complicated, it's just tedious. It's yeah. better if you get, you gotta know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, but, um, you know, interestingly enough, if you were born 200 years ago, you would have definitely learned how to do this when you were probably six or seven years old. I mean, wow. people needed to learn, have these skills so that they could make clothes, make rugs, make all that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. How did you get interested in it? Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, another weird story, but, so the true story is when I was seven years old, I had an ear infection and I had a, uh, a bag of cotton balls that were next to me. And I was reading the World Encyclopedia that my dad bought in 1962 and spinning and I kept thinking spinning and I, then I took the ball and I started to spin thread. Wow. So then from there, I took a bicycle wheel and a spinning wheel. Then from there, I, whatever, I built a loom 
And I was about 12 years old when I built the loom. My uncle helped me, and the loom quite large like this. And then my grandmother walks into the kind of small shed where the loom was, and she almost had a heart attack because apparently my great grandfather, her father, was a silk weaver oh. from Northern Italy. Oh I mean, God. the short story I always say, well, it was my great grandfather who taught me, but it was not really. And you know, again, back to this notion of former lives. You know, people talk about um, ancestral memory that we were all born with some kind yeah. of memories from before. So I have no idea why I still do it. I, I just it relaxes me. Um, you know, I tend to be you know, hectic -y kind of person. Uh, but for some reason, this Brown just puts you. me in a place where I can do all this tedious work. And, you know, it's really relaxing and produce things and I sell things and it's really cool. That's really neat. You know, the grounding part is so important. Yeah, there's sure. so many challenges in life. And yeah. I think as long as each of us find what does that, sometimes yeah, it's absolutely. gardening, sometimes it's music, exactly. reading, walking. Yeah. I, I, I remember, I think it was Rosie Greer from the New York Giants used mm -hmm. to knit. Yes, yeah, exactly. Right. And so does I the Swedish oh, Army. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Swedish, yeah, it's always a funny thing because, you know, the other thing is, you know, when you do these things, they're, they're, they're always considered feminine. And I think it was so interesting that my great grandfather was a weaver. He was a silk weaver. Uh, and in Northern Italy, there's a silk, a silk production that's directly connected to Marco Polo's trips from China. Uh, the mulberry bushes with, that the uh, silkworms eat off of grow there profusely everywhere. And so it worked really well in Italy. And so he was a silk weaver. And, you know, it's kind of like the chef thing, you know, uh, chefs are, are uh, male, cooks are female, you know, so yeah, but weaving, those boxes oh, I know, I know, work. stupid, really stupid, yeah. and weaving, so weaving uh, this way, hand weaving, um, it is pretty much still a lot of women who do it, but I find it really cool that I'm not a woman and I do it. I think it's fabulous. <laughs> and yeah. you know, in Morocco, Dave and I were in Morocco, uh -huh. and the people that do the knitting, yeah. the gorgeous hats, and it's really mm. beautiful work by yeah. the men. Yes, sure. Um, I'm just curious about this. So can you make something as wide yes. as, yes. as, wide as from, yep. from end to end? Exactly, it's 62 inches long, and I could actually do the whole thing. Um, wow. Which I, I have not done on this loom, but I've done it on other looms, and yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have a sort of standard rug I make, which is uh, 36 inches by uh, 45 inches, so that's what I'm doing here, but I could absolutely do the whole length. Yep. All right, so now we're over here at the second loom, just moved over from there, and we can get an idea of what you're doing. Sure. Good. We're going to move out of the way so, so the viewers <laughs> can right. see. So, um, the, so this loom is actually on loan to me from the Boston, uh, the, the Brantford Historical Society, and the pieces of the loom that are the dark one is a loom that was here in Brantford probably about 80 years ago. Um, they were looms called Union looms that were actually produced in upstate New York, and they were considered portable. <laughs> so wow. very heavy, heavy. Um, so it's funny. And then what I did, I, I just added this uh, the lighter wood. I just added. Uh, more pieces on it to preserve a little bit of the old loom mm -hmm. so it puts less stress on the older loom and I hung this thing called the beater down from the top and it, the way it works is so simple so you, you uh, wind on the warp threads on the back then you bring them through what's called the harnesses and each, each thread has its own pedal which is, has a hole in it and um, so on this loom I basically uh, thread so um, from the first, second, third, and fourth harness I, I thread that way and then when I press the pedals I open up the what's called the shed so you open up a space in between the threads so that you can put the shuttle through and that's how you basically weave. The front, this is called a beater which is basically a big comb that uh, packs down the weft, you call it, the weft that goes across and um, and then, and then as you go, as you move forward, excuse me, I, re I can release the, um, uh, the back end of the loom uh, and then the ratchet and then it comes forward as I wind it on the front. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, a really simple idea. Um, it seems complicated, but it's really very easy. I mean, I always say it's like a big potholder machine. You know, we're making big potholders. Yeah, we used to do that as children. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, and, and so this, this is, so this is, um, I'm weaving kind of traditional rag rugs, which are 
actually do have a really interesting history in Brantford because there were a lot of Swedes who came to Brantford. And rag rugs, um, although they were done by a lot of people, the Swedes still today are very uh, focused on making rag rugs. And what, they, what it is is you take old cloth, so old clothes, uh, anything sort of old, and you make strip, stripes, strips <laughs> of it, and then this becomes the thread, the weft. And then you weave into the stronger cotton, I have a cotton warp here, and th these will be small rugs. And oh. yeah, and um, what's fun is, you know, creatively I can basically take, you know, whatever colors I want, and I do a really brief sewing stitch to connect them, like this. It's just a quick sewing stitch. And then uh, I just make, you know, uh, ribbons and ribbons and ribbons and ribbons, and then I put them all together, I roll them up in a ball, and then I put them on the shuttle. I attach them to the shuttle like this, and then um, you wind it on the shuttle, and then you just weave. So. And is it always cotton? No, it could be anything. No, I mean, I could do straw if I wanted. I could do anything. You know, you see rattan rugs, which yes. is, right, which is kind of like fiber, and yeah. But this is just, you know, closed, and, and then you just weave. So the, the petals will separate the threads, and then you pass the shuttle through, and then uh, you sort of make sure it's uh, kind of uh, all the way through, and then you just beat it down, packs it into place, and then you change the uh, direction of the threads. So every other thread goes down. Now I threw the shell through, and then I put the bang the um, beater forward, and then I change the threads, and I just throw it through. And you basically keep doing this until you're driven crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually. For me, I always think it's really funny because they used to make people in mental institutions weave because it, it has such a grounding, grounding yeah, and you know, the noise of the loom and the regularity of it. In uh, Connecticut Valley Hospital, CVH, up in Middletown, where I grew up, they had um, a whole huge weaving uh, room with about 100 looms in it that a lot of the people who were having mental problems would be using. And I'm curious, Rob, is it all sort of a surprise how it turns out? Oh, completely. Completely. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, so I'm really bad designer. Like, <laughs> I'm so bad with any kind of design. I'm, I'm really a mechanical weaver, you know, um, and I have a lot of friends who are way better with visuals. And sometimes when I'm making something that's, uh, I'm, like an article for women's clothing is my bane of my existence because I don't really know what might appeal to a woman, so I end up asking a lot of my friends, you know, I'm making scarves, you know, what do you like, what do you don't like, what colors do you like, so yeah. that's really helpful. Yeah. So when I make the rag rugs, I kind of just wing it, and I have behind you, it's off camera, but there's just a ton of fabric that comes from sheets and curtains and old shirts, and you know, I just kind of, when I build a rug like this, I just kind of go and grab colors I think would go together, I cut the fabric into strips and then I sew them together. So um, here's some examples. Um, this one is a little bit used because it's been on my floor for a couple of years. But this is an example of uh, what I do. Um, again, just sort of willy-nilly putting in the colors. That. Yeah, and then uh, this is two colors. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it, it's so sturdy. No, so this is about three years old. And it's reversible. Also, it's reversible, sure. yes. Yeah. Yep, it's reversible. and. Um, you know, you throw it in the wash. You can throw it in the wash. Wow, and that's yep, good. Yeah, and uh, it won't really shrink. And wow, um, that's excellent. Yeah, and then this one is a newer one that I just finished. Um, I don't know why I'm doing red, white, and blue, but <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> actually, this is red, white, and pink. pink. But anyway, <laughs> so this is sort of a typical rag rug, and they can be any length. Upstairs in the house, I have one that's 15 feet long. Wow. That's along the the hallway of the upper uh, the upper hallway upstairs. But this is basically what you find, and, and there are a lot of people who are way more creative than I am <laughs> that build yeah, some really beautiful color combinations and, and things with just rags, with old cloth. Yes, that's but the beauty to it recycle. Is, yeah, exactly, exactly, yes, exactly, it's recycling. And it, it also uh, harkens back to the old days when, you know, you had one pair of, uh, one pair of underwear, one, pair, one dress, <laughs> one pair of pants, and when those got old and holy, you know, you'd get a new one, but then that cloth you would take and you would, uh, and you would reuse. make reuse and you would make rugs. Yep. Yeah, I love it. I wonder if that was one of the reasons why uh, during the uh, World War II time or just post-war, uh -huh. uh, in Brooklyn, New York, where I lived, we uh -huh. had 
a um, man who came by yelling uh, outside in the uh, courtyard of the apartment buildings, the mm -hmm. two apartment buildings, uh, I cash clothes. He bought used clothing yep. that I think they maybe used to manufacture were, other products. Maybe they were doing, yeah, exactly. I mean, you can really do a lot with old stuff. I mean, the other thing that they used to make, in, which I do too, and I'm not really good at it, but I do it uh, for the Christmas shop that I have, um, is uh, quilts. You know, yeah. so, yeah, so you just cut up, I cut up squares, I sew them into long strips, <coughs> I sew the strips together, I put it back on, put it, put some cotton inside, and boom. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. And Robert, here's another adorable little Yeah, it's, it's yeah. like the three little moons. Yeah, three little moons. Uh, exactly. But Robert, these colors are luscious. I know. So this is because I asked my friends, oh. my feminine girlfriends, <laughs> right. to tell me. So this loom is the one that I always had in New York because it was small enough for my apartment and whatnot. And it's built on the same principle. The threads go up and down, the beater in the front. And then <clears throat> I just make scarves on this. Mm -hmm. They're um, really lightweight, very pretty colors. And oh, yeah, beautiful. and it's a really cute loom. I use it here. I'll be using it shortly. It's not threaded up yet, but it's going to be, and I'll be using it to make scarves. So it's an apartment winter. size. It's an apartment size, yeah. <laughs> I love. Uh, the suggestion of your friend with the hot pink and yeah, the soft, it's yes. luscious. It's luscious, yeah. I love it. And I make uh, shawls and also scarves for wow. women. I used to, I used to um, do this in the city and sell my scarves on 86 and oh, really? Columbus across the street from the Natural History Museum. On every Sunday, there's a flea market. Oh, I used to do that. Yeah, it was fun. I'd bring my spinning wheel oh. and I'd spin, and people were like, "What are you doing?" Oh, that, that was a good attraction. Yeah, exactly. A so, big, do you want to show a big our dude viewers? spinning? Yeah. Yes. Uh, sure. The viewers, our you're spinning. So here we are, going for a spin. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this, so this uh, is a spinning wheel. Obviously, um, I again along the relaxation thing. Um, this wheel is really cool. It's from Boston, oh. and it was probably it's probably about 250, 300 years old, and um, wow. it still clicks along. You know, makes this noise. Wow. And what I, I'm I'm spinning um, uh, alpaca. Wow! Well, actually, that is from so warm yeah, and from, wonderful. Mm -hmm, from um, from Connecticut, from up in Deep River, uh, wow. a guy who was raising alpaca, and. Uh, you know, um, yeah, it's it's a very relaxing sort of art. And um, the other thing that's on the loom, around the spinning wheel, is this flax. And what's cool about Brantford and flax was that Brantford was actually a um, huge center of flax production. And flax is this hair. It comes from a plant. And it, when spun and woven, it's linen. So oh, linen, linen is flax. Is linen. Yeah. Wow. And Brantford, you know, in Brantford we have Flax Mill Road. Uh -huh. Do you know that road? No, yeah. it's a road not far away from here. And um, and so um, so Brantford and Guilford were actually really well known for flax production. Um, Brushy Plain and all that area up there yeah. was all fields of flax. And actually Alexander Hamilton, when he came through Brantford, made mention of the fact that there were a lot of flax fields around here. They're beautiful plants because they grow and then they have a, a purple flower oh, okay. on top so the fields can look quite beautiful. Yeah, yeah and Brantford was really known for this so this kind of production uh, before the Industrial Revolution and before big spinning machines this is how they spun flax and spinning was pretty much a woman young girl's uh, job except in the winter so in the winter because there was such a need for a lot of thread um, the winter actually would, uh, the men would spin too because they really didn't do much outside. Oh. Wow, just fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so, viewers, I know you're going to share with us how exciting this has been. <laughs> yeah. I mean, your passion just, um, yeah. it's palpable. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, we thank you so oh, no, much for really your time. Fun. No, it's really been fun. It's been, and, it's been yeah. for us, too. Yeah, and, thank you so much. And viewers, <clears throat> we thank you so much for joining and meeting one of our most special neighbors <laughs> here in Brantford, Robert yeah. Ayudi. And please join us next month for another episode of Meet Your Neighbors. <laughs>